Hello lovelies, in this video we're going to be looking at controlling blood glucose for your A-level biology. Now this is a topic they really frequently link with other things. So it could be linked with diabetes, it could be linked with back into the beginning of homeostasis, it could be linked with kidney structure. There are lots of ways this could be linked to other lessons within this topic. It is a really common one for them to link out to other things. Hi everyone. Okay, so we're going to look at controlling blood glucose concentration as one of our obviously examples of controlling a factor in the body using the endocrine system. So we mentioned this previously, but just to recap why it's important that we need to make sure we maintain our blood glucose levels, it should stay between about four to eight millimoles per dm cubed of blood. That's that's the ideal range. If it's below four, or above eight on these little prick machines that you can get where you can test your blood, um, where you do a finger prick, put a little bit of blood onto the little strip and the machine will read blood glucose content. They are obviously got better other equipment now where you can use kind of a phone that it talks to a little patch that you have that sends it to an app on your phone where you can scan the little patch with your phone and it will tell you your reading as well. People who have type 1 diabetes are very familiar with these different technologies. So why is it important that we keep our blood glucose level within this range? Well, if it drops too low, then cells might not have enough glucose for respiration and they may not be able to function normally. Brain cells are particularly sensitive to this. Your brain actually needs quite a lot of glucose to function. And it uses a lot of, it needs, requires a lot of energy. So if your blood glucose levels drop, similar to if your blood oxygen levels drop, then your brain is, is very particularly affected. If blood glucose levels are too high, it can disrupt the water potential, like we said. So blood plasma, it can change the water potential and then have osmotic effects. So cause water to start moving in and out of cells if the blood plasma and the tissue fluid aren't isotonic to your cell cytoplasm. So we don't want to get it too high for that reason. So let's have a think about how we're going to control this then. So the blood glucose concentration is going to be controlled by the parts of the endocrine system. So it's to do with hormones and we're using glands to be able to control this. So the receptors that are going to be detecting the blood glucose levels are located in regions called the islets of Langerhans, which is uh, the endocrine tissue inside the pancreas. We'll look at that in a bit more detail in a second. The signals that we're sending is hormones. So hopefully from GCSE we should remember the hormones are insulin and glucagon and they are both secreted by the pancreas and they'll be traveling around in the bloodstream. And then the effectors which are going to cause our blood glucose level to either increase or decrease are going to be uh, in multiple organs and cells. So the liver, the muscle cells and fat cells are the target cells of these hormones. Target cells means they have specific receptors on their cell membranes for insulin and glucagon. So that only cells that have these receptors are going to respond to insulin and glucagon because they're the only ones that have the receptors that will bind to them. So they act as effectors and they're gonna help us either raise or lower our blood glucose levels. Okay, so the main cause of blood glucose increasing is when we eat. So when we um, consume carbohydrates that are then broken down into monosaccharides, including glucose, and they're absorbed into the blood through the small intestine. So anytime you eat after food, um, you're going to increase that blood glucose level when it's absorbed into the blood through the small intestine walls. But there are some other ways that your body can increase your blood glucose level. So glycogen, remember, that is the storage molecule, um, a long chain carbohydrate that we use to store glucose in the body in animals. So glycogen stores in the liver are broken down to release glucose. And this process is called glycogenolysis. It makes sense, it's basically glycogen glycogenolysis. So if we think about what we know, so we're, we're talking about breaking down glycogen in the same way if we think about hydrolysis what lysis means is to split so we are basically splitting glycogen the other thing the liver can do is that it can actually convert other substances into glucose so we can take lactate which is obviously um, produced from lactic acid which is made in the muscles during anaerobic respiration and finds its way into the blood and it can find its way to the liver it can use lactate and convert that into glucose. 
amino acids, for example, pyruvate, which is a protein that also is going to be produced and going to be able to be released into the blood from muscles as well during respiration. So that can be used as well. Other amino acids as well. And then glycerol from fatty acids from fat stores can also be released, sent to the liver. And we use these to create glucose. And if you think about it again, this is another term that we need to know. There's lots of words in this topic that we're going to have to get used to, and they all sound very similar. But in this case, we've got gluconeogenesis. So gluco, meaning glucose in this case, neo, meaning new, and genesis, meaning to make, or the start of something. They're thinking about the book of the Bible, for example, the, the book of Genesis, that's about the creation of the earth. We're making something new. So gluco, glucose, neo, new, genesis, making new glucose. And that's how the liver is, can also do it. And in both of these cases, whether we are converting from glycogen to glucose or we are creating glucose from other molecules, we're then going to be able to release that glucose into the bloodstream and therefore blood glucose levels are going to increase. Blood glucose levels can also obviously decrease for various reasons. So when the liver removes glucose from the blood and converts it to glycogen. So this process that we looked at initially is reversible. Hopefully we remember this from GCSE because this is how we should remember that glucose is removed from the blood when insulin is released from the pancreas in order to lower blood glucose levels. So that's one way which we should be fairly familiar with. The other thing to think about is sort of the opposite of eating food, really. You, you eat the food and the carbohydrates and that increases your blood glucose level. And then the opposite to that is if you do some exercise. So if you need to use up that glucose during respiration, then you're going to have to, you're going to reduce your blood glucose levels because glucose is going to be being removed from the blood and going into the muscle cells. So one more thing, which is kind of an extra thing, but it's good to know. So drinking alcohol can actually prevent the liver from producing glucose. It slows down the liver's function because instead of dealing with the glucose, it's helping to sort out the alcohol in your system. So it can actually cause a decrease in blood sugar levels. So previously we talked briefly about the fact that there's two types of gland tissue in the pancreas. So there's endocrine glands and these are glands that secrete hormones directly into the blood. And there's exocrine glands and they secrete hormones through ducts. So that's two type of, types of glandular tissue, and the pancreas contains both of these. So it has exocrine tissue and endocrine tissue within the pancreas. This makes sense because we should know already that the pancreas has a dual role in the body. It is part of the digestive system, and so it secretes our digestive enzymes. And we also know, hopefully, that it secretes the hormones that we need to control our blood glucose levels. So it has both types of tissue. The exocrine tissue, or the exocrine cells, are responsible for secreting the, the digestive system enzymes. So they are kind of these kind of round shaped cells and they have like a tube in the middle that, and all those tubes eventually join up to this bile duct here, which obviously comes from the gallbladder as well, where bile comes down from the gallbladder. This joins up into the pancreas with the bile duct in the pancreatic and tissue. And then they secrete the enzymes and the bile all goes together into the small intestine at the duodenum. So that's one role. And then the rest of the tissue, what we call the islets of Langerhans, capital L for Langerhans, because it was named after the person who discovered it. So around or dotted around, there's these kind of circular bits of tissue and inside is cells. And these cells are endocrine cells. So they're secreting hormones directly into the capillaries and they're responsible for releasing our hormones into the blood. There's two types of cells that make up the islets of Langerhans. There are alpha cells and the alpha cells are responsible for producing and secreting glucagon. And we have our beta cells and these are responsible for secreting insulin. OK, so we've got pancreas tissue. We've got the exocrine pancreas cells, they secrete digestive enzymes and they travel into the duodenum um, from the bile duct. And then we have our endocrine tissue, which are called the islets of Langerhans. They're these sort of circle groups of cells dotted around inside the main pancreas tissue, which is the exocrine cells. 
And inside those islets of Langerhans, we have two types of cells, the alpha cells that secrete the glucagon and the beta cells that secrete the insulin. And obviously they're releasing those directly into the bloodstream. Right, so let's look at what actually happens um, when blood glucose is too high or too low. Now this is mostly similar to what you would have done at GCSE, but there will be some differences, mostly just a little bit more detail. So initially, obviously, the change is de detected. So when blood glucose is too high, the change is detected by beta cells. And I've used the little Greek symbol beta here. So the change is de detected by the beta cells because they start increasing how much glucose is moving into them by facilitating diffusion. So that's how they start kind of detect this increase in blood glucose. So in response, this kind of increase in Glucose in the cell causes vesicles that contain the insulin to move towards the cell membrane and then release that contents into the capillaries. Now, this is very obviously similar to what we previously looked at with the idea of an action potential causing those voltage gated um, calcium channels to open, causing those vesicles of neurotransmitters to move, fuse with the membrane and release the neurotransmitter. This is very similar. So, glucose uh, concentration increasing in the cell causes these vesicles of insulin to move towards the cell membrane, fuse and release it by exocytosis. So then the insulin is going to travel to our target cells. We already talked about the fact that they could be liver cells, fat cells, muscle cells. So they're going to travel to the target cells and their target cells because they have those receptors. So they're going to bind to the receptors on those cells. And what they cause is they cause them to take up more glucose from the blood. How do they do that? Well, what they actually do is they trigger the cell to increase the amount of glucose transporter proteins. So those um, transport proteins that's going to be doing facilitated diffusion of glucose. They increase how many of those are on their cell membrane. So if they have more of those in their cell membrane, they've increased their permeability to glucose. So they're going to start taking up more glucose from the blood. And that's how we get our blood glucose level to decrease. liver takes this sort of one step further in the fact that we've also said about how the liver plays a role in controlling blood glucose levels. So as well as increasing its permeability to glucose, it also starts converting glucose into glycogen to store it. And that means that it's going to be sort of removing that glucose concentration from the cells because it's, it's converting it into glycogen, which is an insoluble storage molecule. And so that means that it can maintain that concentration gradient. So it means that there's always a low concentration of glucose in the liver, higher concentration of glucose in the blood. So it maintains that concentration gradient and makes sure that glucose is moving into the liver cells. Okay, so that's what happens if blood glucose goes too high. What happens if blood glucose goes too low? Well, it's very similar to start. The change is gonna be detected, but this time by both alpha and beta cells. Now this is important because we can't have glucagon and insulin released at the same time. They, they work antagonistically to each other, like muscles that we talked about. So they are not able to work at the same time because they counteract each other. So when blood glucose drops too low, the beta cells detect this because the concentration of glucose in their cells is going to lower. And so they stop releasing insulin. But those vesicles of insulin stop moving to the cell membrane and it stops releasing insulin. But the alpha cells detect it and they start releasing glucagon. Again, the glucagon travels in the blood and it binds to target cells on the liver. And so it binds to those receptors on the cell membrane of the liver. It's going to cause a couple of things to happen. Um, mostly it's going to cause the liver to do the opposite of what happened when glucose is too high. So it starts breaking glycogen down into glucose, which as we said before, is glycogenolysis. Remember glycogen, olysis, the splitting of glycogen. So it's gonna start doing that to release glucose into the blood. The glucagon also activates enzymes which are going to start the process of gluconeogenesis in the liver. Remember that means making glucose from other molecules. So things like lactate and pyruvate from muscles and glycerol from fat tissue. So the liver is going to start making more glucose from those kind of products that we have from fat tissue and from uh, respiration in muscle cells. All of this leads to glucose, more glucose being released into the blood, which raises those blood sugar levels. 
And so we go back towards the optimum. So that's the pattern. We need to be able to describe that and what happens for both of those and pretty much in that level of detail and be able to kind of think about how these messages and signals are getting along. So thinking about the receptors, shapes fitting together, the fact that those trigger a cascade, which we're going to look at in the next video. So how we have these idea of once the insulin binds to the liver, how does it actually trigger glycogenolysis or gluconeogenesis? Because the insulin itself isn't moving into those cells. It's just triggering other processes to happen in those cells, which is what we call secondary messengers, which carry that signal into the cell and cause that change. So we're going to have a look at that in the next video. But it's mostly thinking about, do we, can we remember which cells do which? Alpha and beta, which hormones and what effect those hormones have and be able to explain how that either raises or lowers the blood glucose levels. Ouch! This is why in some videos I have unexplained scratches.